Exodus chapter 16. We're just going to read a few verses uh, from this passage. We won't read the entire uh, chapter's context. Those of you who've been saved for a while are probably familiar with the passage as you turn there, Exodus chapter 16. And I'm going to talk to you about one of the miracles that God did in the Old Testament and a couple things that it points to that are in the New Testament and are in our present day. In Exodus chapter 16, if you have it, we're going to begin our reading tonight in verse number 11. Would you stand with me, please, in reverence for the reading of the Scripture tonight. Exodus chapter 16, where we will begin reading at verse 11 and go down through verse 15. What a blessing to see all these Bibles in this place. Amen. One of the discouraging things about churches these days is it's hard to find song books or Bibles in the house of God. That's right. And that's, that's discouraging, really. A lot of churches, they, they, don't have, uh, they don't have hardly any song books, and many of them don't have very many Bibles because so many people are not using Bibles anymore and maybe just use an iPad or something. But Exodus chapter 16, would you look please at verse 11, where the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Oh my. Reckon the Lord's heard the murmurings of the Baptists of, of Jacksonville? Amen. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. I, and sometimes it goes on even in churches. Yeah. My wife sitting out in, in uh, the midst of Baptists in churches have heard people murmur during the preaching. Yeah. I mean, some people talk, you know, just do their talking back and forth, but... Uh, she's heard people murmuring about the preaching and back talking the preaching from the from the pew. I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, Upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. We're told that the word manna means what is it? Because they didn't know what it was, they called it that. They called it manna. And verse 15 will be our text verse for tonight's message. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. Would you bow your heads together with me for prayer? Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. God's given us some bread today. And uh, that bread is what we just have read from. Amen. And I want to talk to you tonight about it. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Father, thank you for the songs of Zion. Thank you for the song that you put in the heart of a redeemed people. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy in the gospel. Thank you for these who come to church tonight. I pray that you would bless them, each one. I pray that you would work in our midst. I pray that you would help us to appreciate this particular truth. And I pray that this truth would revitalize our spiritual condition and would revive our lives. I do pray that if there's any person here that's unsaved, that this would be the day of salvation for them. And I pray for Christian people that you try this truth in our hearts, that we might not try to live one day outside of the will of God and one day without getting into the Word of God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Be seated, please. Tonight, I want to bring you a message on the manna from heaven. God sent this unusual bread to sustain the Jews in their wilderness journeys. They had never seen anything like it. According to verse 4, uh, this bread was given to test the Israelites. And you can read more about it to see uh, how that they did uh, get tested by the Lord. And some of them failed the test with regard to uh, this man on the way it was provided. He said, I'm going to provide it for you. And there in verse 4 as bread raining down from heaven. And he said, I'm going to give you 
uh, the ability to give a certain rate each day, and it's for the purpose that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now, it's obvious to people who know the New Testament, for people who are saved and New Testament Christians who study the New Testament, that the man of the Old Testament pointed to, and we call the word a type when something points to something in the New Testament, it pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. He is the true bread from heaven. On our radio program, I've been preaching and teaching in John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, Jesus said, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So there's one sense in which the manna appointed to our Savior, the Son of God the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is the true bread from heaven. But any sincere Bible student know that there's a connection between the Son of God, uh, the living Word, and the Scriptures, the written Word, and there are ways in which this manna also points us not only to Jesus, the living Word, but also to the Word of God, the written Word were the scriptures that you and I have in such abundance uh, tonight. And I'm going to use that uh, reference to the bread that God sent, man, to say a few things tonight to you about this book that you have in your hands. And the longer you come to this church, I hope that if you're saved, that you will appreciate more every day this book that God has given you, that you'll never take it for granted, that you'd never despise it. There are actually people who despise uh, the Bible, who despise the Word of God. The message tonight is titled, Manna from Heaven. Manna from Heaven. I've been accused of believing that the King James Bible parachuted down from heaven. And my response to them is, yes, I do. And guess where I believe that other version crawled up out of? Amen. Amen. I'll let you finish that. Amen. The Jews called this bread manna because they didn't know what it was. So every time they referred to this supernatural bread, they were or this bread, they were recognizing that they re didn't really know what they had. And I'm afraid there's a lot of people that don't really know what they've got in their hands and how precious that it is. I love to see people revere the Word of God. Amen. I believe if you will revere the Word of God and you're saved, it'll change the way that you live. Amen. People who love this book will try to be more obedient uh, to what this book says. Right. And I can tell lots of times uh, how much a person loves the Word of God simply by how they live. And if they're not living right, you mark her down. They're not living in the Word of God daily like they should be at the house in the Word of God. I want to just show you a few very simple things about this manna tonight that can give you some lessons about this book that you hold in your hand. God has given it to you for your food and sustenance through your wilderness journeys until we get to the other side. First thing that I want to say about the manna that points to the Word of God that you have in your hand, you can look at it, please, in verse 4. And I want to say the manna was supernatural. It was supernatural. It wasn't natural. It was supernatural. Oh, may God uh, help us to realize the things of God are supernatural. Right. And so many people that meet in Jesus' name, and everything that they do can be done according to the flesh. In many churches, just about everything that they do can be done just like a salesman would do it, just like a club might do it, just like some kind of a group of philosophers might do it. But I yearn to see the supernatural. And I'm not saying that I, I'm needing things for my senses. I'm just saying that I'm yearning for God to move in hearts of people at Glenwood Baptist Church and through Glenwood Baptist Church. Verse 4 says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, 
the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And the thing I want to point out to you from that verse is this, uh, this meat uh, in the wilderness, this bread in the wilderness that God supplied, it was supernatural. It came down from God out of heaven. Yeah. And yes, the Lord used tools to provide your Bible that you hold in your hand. But this book is God given. Amen. Many people say that it is God breathed because the Bible uses the word uh, inspiration in 2 Timothy 3.16 where the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17 that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I say this book is, is given by inspiration of God. You ought to revere your Bible. You ought to love your Bible. I don't believe you ought to ever exalt anything more than the Lord. I don't believe that you ought to uh, ever get to where you love the things of God more than you love the God of the things. But you ought to be thankful for everything that God gives you. And probably outside of salvation itself, there's nothing, and I feel confident, there's nothing that you can put your hands on that God has given you that is more precious than the Word of God. There's not a thing in this world, I believe, that you can put your hand on that is more precious that God has allowed you to have than this Word of God that we hold in our hands. Oh, my friend, it, it bothers me uh, to see people... I have an irreverent attitude That's right. toward the Word of God. Amen. That includes, dearly beloved, when we're preaching, when we're reading Amen. the Word of God together here. But let me say from that, this first thought that this book is supernatural. Amen. Just like the manna was supernatural, this book is supernatural. It's supernatural in its design. God made this book. And I personally believe that the Word of God is given by inspiration of God and it's kept by preservation of God. And I believe that the book that we have in our hands today is God's infallible, inerrant, and inspired Word. I believe that it has the, the mark of God's imprint and design upon it. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul was writing to the Thessalonians and saying something that he thanked God for about those converts. And he said... For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 Dearly beloved, what a blessing it is. When I got you folks to hold your Bibles up, what a blessing it is to have a church of people that believe that this book we hold in our hands is God's word. Now, when you talk to unsaved people, they'll say, that's man's book. Yeah. But God's people know that this is God's book. Amen. And among God's people, there are people who've had their understanding perverted by the thinking of men to where they might think that the translations are all relative yeah. one toward another, and one is just better than another, and you can choose the one that you prefer and you like best. I don't believe that. I believe that one of them, I believe that God's Word has been preserved in the end time language, English, and I believe that there's one book that is God's book, and that's the King James Bible. Amen. And I believe that all of the rest are imitations. I believe all of the rest are counterfeit. Amen. And this is the real thing. This is God's plumb line. Amen. This is God's plumb bob. For those of you that know anything about trying to build something, this is the standard by which everything can be measured to see whether it really lines up or not. Yeah. Carpenter say, I can look at that and tell that ain't square. Yeah. And if you know your Bible, you can see something show up on the internet, you can see something show up on the television set, you can see something show up in church and say, I know that ain't square. <laughs> Why? Because it don't square with the book. It don't square with your Bible. Not only is the Word of God supernatural in its design, but it's supernatural in its descent. And I mean by that is, is that many things have been written that came from the heart of men. But this book came from the heart of God. Amen. And it did descend 
And I'm not trying to be irreverent. And if you uh, find fault with me jokingly saying, yes, I believe, you know, I'm doing that, <coughs> speaking as a fool. But yes, I, I'm, more, I'm more, more out to claim that I do say that the King James Bible parachuted down from heaven than just to say it's a book like anybody else's book. I don't believe that. I, I just don't believe it. I believe this book is supernatural, just like the manna uh, was. Supernatural in its design, supernatural in its descent, and supernatural in its distribution. Amen. The manna was given by God to be distributed. It was everywhere, all over the place. The Lord gave the word, great was, great was the company of them that published it, the Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 11. When you read in this context in Exodus chapter uh, 16, you'll find that the manna was sufficient for everybody. Yeah. And I mean to tell you that the Bible will meet your need. Amen. I believe a lot of people could save money going to the psychiatrist's couch and going to the pharmaceuticals uh, uh, counter if they would. And I'm not, and I'm not saying you never need to go to somebody outside of your church. But I'm saying I believe that a lot of people could save a lot of money by just going to God's book and getting what God has for you. Amen. Some of you know that I've written a little booklet from a sermon I preached I called Mental Health, God's Way. And I don't claim to be an expert in solving all the problems of the mind, but I do believe that the Bible says a lot about your emotional state. Right. I believe the Bible says a lot about uh, that are commandments to you about your emotional state. So many people think their emotional state is something that controls them. God wants you to control your emotions. Amen. 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 God says to you, fear not. That's right. God Amen. says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Yeah. Right. Amen. God says, control it. That's right. And if you don't control it, it's not because that uh, you just have this condition that you've got to be drugged up on to get rid of the condition. If you don't control your emotions, it's because you're disobedient to God. Amen. God says, peace. peace. Be still. God says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So the book is supernatural in its distribution. It'll help you manage your money. Amen. It'll help you manage your kids. It'll help you manage your tongue. Right. It'll help you manage your mind. Amen. It'll help you manage your temper. It'll help manage your church. Amen. It'll help manage your Christian life. It'll help ma manage your marriage. Amen. Say amen. Amen. You get two people that will love God and, and put God first. Marriage really takes three. And if you'll have two people that will center their lives around God and will go by God's manual for the home. Amen. That's one of the things this Bible is. Not, that's not all it is, but one of the things that it is God's manual for the home. Right. And if you'll build your life around the Lord and around what this Word says, it will sure save you a lot of money in the divorce court. I don't know what say amen. 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 Second thing I'm going to say about the manna that points to the word of the Lord. Not only was it supernatural, but the Bible tells us here that it was small. It was kind of small and insignificant. Look at verse 14 again. If you have your Bibles open, the Bible says, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And the, in the auditorium Sunday school class, Brother Huey has been teaching uh, through the book of Revelation. Wonderful, wonderful book. And while we may not understand everything we read in the book, it thrills our hearts uh, to know that, that even though that there is coming a terrible time of tribulation on the earth, for the Bible believer, the best is yet to come. Amen. And this book ends so wonderfully in the last couple of chapters, if you're saved. But in that book, the book of Revelation, there was a time where John was, was given a little book. He was given a little book in Revelation chapter 10. And you know what God told him to do with it? He said, I want you to eat it. 
He said, I want you to eat it. I'm telling you that the manna does point to the Word of God written as well as the true bread from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. There's some lessons you can get from God getting you through your wilderness journey without starvation, without a discouragement, without failure, and without famine. You can get through to the other side and say, God has been with me, taking care of me all the way. Manna was small. Since the manna was small, it was easily observed. I mean, it was all over the ground. But if you really wanted to see it well, if you wanted to examine it, you know what you had to do? You had to bow down. Yeah. If you really wanted to see, what is this? That's what manna meant. What is this? And as you got down, if you really wanted to check it out, a good way to... If you want to really find out what's in this book, if you want to really examine this book, examine this book prayerfully. Amen. Psalm 119, one verse says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Amen. I read the Bible through from front to back. My wife just finished reading it through again. And, and I do it continuously. Uh, through the years, I do not claim to understand everything that I read. But I do read the Bible and I do study the Bible. And it's my prayer to God to help me learn the Bible. Yeah. I've been praying for that uh, ever, especially ever since I surrendered to preach. When God called me to preach, I was scared to death. Not so much about standing up in front of you folks. But I was scared to death to stand up in front of people and not have a clue about what I was saying. Yeah. Really. And I knew when God called me to preach. I never read the Bible all the way through when God called me to preach. But I thank God that through the years that He's given me some things that are in this book. And, and it's been given to me because I recognized that I was simple. And I needed help. Amen. Psalm 119 uh, 103, uh, uh, one, yeah, 103, I think it is, uh, says, uh, Open thou mine eyes that I may hold, behold wondrous things. That, no, it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And uh, dearly beloved, that's me. I believe it's 130. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light and giveth understanding unto the simple. If you don't understand the Word of God, just jump in the boat with, with the rest of us who say there's things in the Bible we don't understand. That's right. Okay? Amen. I'm saved, and I do know the Bible in the sense that I know some of the things that's in the Word of God. I don't know the Bible, and I don't know anybody else that knows the Bible all the way through from front to back or understands everything in the Bible from front to back. But you know what? I've got a comforting word in James chapter 1. Verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, Amen. who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Amen. Write that down, James 1, 5, mm -hmm. and make up your mind that you are going to get out on your knees, humble yourself before God, don't approach the Word of God as somebody that knows everything about it and is an expert. That's right. That's right. I've been saved for a long time. I've been reading the Bible for a long time. I do not claim to be an expert. And when I read the Bible, I don't go to the Bible. No, I don't go to the Bible as a brand new baby in Christ. But I don't go to the Bible as an expert on it. I go to the Bible simply, humbly asking God to miraculously give me something for today that I need from the Word of God. The manna was small, so it could be easily observed. Another thing that we can learn about that from it being small is the sad thing is it also, if somebody wasn't willing, it could be also easily overlooked. When something is little, you can miss it. Yeah. I realize that it was all over the place, but you know what? Bibles are all over the United States of America. Yeah. And people overlook it. You can go from here. You don't have to go three miles mm -hmm. to be able to find a place where you can buy you a dozen Bibles. Right. And if you go within five miles, you can buy hundreds of Bibles. Right. Within five miles of this spot, 
right here. You can buy hundreds of Bibles. And I'm talking about the right kind. I'm not talking about all that other kind. And you know what? A lot of people drive by stores that have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of Bibles, and that's the answer for their problems. Yeah. They're driving down the road, and they're having mental problems. They're driving down the road, and they're thinking about their relationships with their girlfriend or their, or their mate, their, their spouse or whatever. They're going down the road, and they're trying to figure out, how in the world am I going to get through this week? Uh, without starving? How am I going to get through this week without suicide? How am I going to go through, through this week without a divorce? How am I going to go through this week uh, without a, have some kind of tragedy if, if I just can't get an answer? And they pass by the answer. Yep. They drive by churches. They drive by Christian bookstores. They drive by Dollar Tree. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know this is at the Dollar Tree? Right. And they drive by and they miss it because it's so small. It was small and easily overlooked. Sure. Many presidents have overlooked the Word of God and its importance because it seems so little compared to all the pressures that they're under. Yeah. The judges of the United States Supreme Court have overlooked the Word of God through the years right. because it seems so little to them against all of the pressures that are upon them. Many people overlook the Bible as being one book among so, uh, so many others. Dearly beloved, I would encourage every child of God to become a person who is well acquainted with this book. Amen. Now, the manna was so small, it could be easily observed. It could be easily overlooked. Mm -hmm. Praise God, it also could be easily obtained. Amen. You didn't have to be strong to get you some manna. All you had to do was be willing to bend over and pick some up. Right. They gathered it every morning, one bit at a time. All of you Christians should want to learn the Word of God. You're not going to learn the Word of God in one week to be qualified to teach the adult Sunday school class like Brother Huey does. But if you want to digest the entire Bible, you know how you do it? One bite at a time. We've given you helps that are out there in the foyer on the table to try to encourage you to read your Bibles through from front to back. The Lord will help me, and I'm not worried about losing any reward. Probably don't have none anyway. But if the Lord will help me, if I can stay on schedule at the end of the year of going through the Bible, reading it, not studying it, but reading it for 113 times. How do you do that? You just get down every day. Get down on your knees and pick up some. And pick you up some manna and start reading it. And folks, the person who knows the Bible the best of anybody you've ever met, learn the Bible the same way you will. Granted, some people read faster than others. Some people assimilate information better than others. Some people retain information better than others. But all of us just get one bit of manna at a time. You just get in there and sit and you read. The manna was small. Third thing I want to say about the manna to point you to your Bible and try to encourage you to love your Bible. Listen, you ought to love your Bible because God wrote it. Amen. You ought to love your Bible because God gave it to you. Amen. You ought to love the Bible because God has given you a prescription for success in life after you're saved in walking as God would have you to walk. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1.8 Good success is God's success. Whether the world recognizes it or not, whether you ever get written up in Fortune 500, or even get mentioned on the internet. Good success is God's success. <coughs> I hope you're jotting down some of these verses. You ought to jot down Joshua 1.8. It'd be a good verse for you to quote to yourself every day. The manna, I will say thirdly, the manna was not only supernatural, it was not only small, but third, it was sustaining. The manna was sustaining. 
And that points us to one of the reasons why God has given you a Bible in written form. Yeah. The manna met the need for food during the wilderness journey. If you were to continue reading down there from verse 15, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. And in verses 15 through 18, there was prescription about each one getting some of the manna. Jesus said to the devil in Luke chapter 4, verse 4, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. Now, if you've got a new international version, it stops right there. If you've got a living Bible, it stops right there. If you've got a new world translation of the Jehovah's False Witnesses, it stops right there. But if you've got a King James Bible, it says, but by every word of God. Amen. That verse alone ought to be, able to be enough to show you the difference between the King James Bible and all of the others. Amen. Luke 4, 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I like concerning it being sustenance for the spiritual man of the believer. I like what Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. He said, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up Amen. and to give you an inheritance among the, all them which are sanctified. You are what you eat, they say. And you need to, if you want to be healthy, eat healthy. And if you want to be healthy spiritually, take in good spiritual food. Amen. The best thing I can recommend to you is this Bible. Amen. Best kind of church I can recommend to you is a church that believes this Bible like we're saying it tonight. And a church that will hammer on the Word of God and give it to you over and over and over and over and over Amen. to where you can get it if you want it. You can learn the Word of God here at Glenwood Baptist Church. Amen. We teach the Word of God in Sunday school. We have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And I'm not against fellowship. And I'm not against the other things that make up our services. But the highlight of every service for the believer that's going to sustain him and keep him going until God calls him home is the Word of God. Saturday afternoon we have Bible Institute. Four classes for people who want some more study in the Bible. I'm saying the manna, like this scripture, was to be their diet. Yeah. It's what we would you might call fuel. You need fuel for your journey. Yeah. I know we've got at least one dear lady in, in the congregation tonight who drove here without using gasoline. Yeah. They've got these cars now that don't use gasoline. Yeah. But you know what? You have to have some kind of fuel. You have some kind of energy to make the thing go. Yeah. What powers you through your life? Yeah. Is it just self-help? Is it just motivational books? Is it just friends that you have? Is it just family that go to this church? Yeah. What will keep you going through the years will be you getting into the Bible every day. Yeah. It is sustaining the Bible is your fuel for living for the Lord. The reason why the average person is unable to go to the same church for many years and to keep working for the Lord for many years is their spiritual diet is bad. That's right. They don't read the Word of God right. daily. The Word of God was to be their diet. You'll see in verse 16 that the Word of God was to be their duty. This, thing, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded Gather of it every man according to his eating. Nobody can do your Bible reading for you. If you're in a family where one person reads the Word of God, thank God for it. But that doesn't take care of you. No more than you can be sustained by going to the Taco Bell after church is over and watch other people eat tacos. You better decide you're going to eat something for yourself. You may know some people that's, that labor in the Word, but you need to get some every day for yourself. A bunch of us went last week down to an eating place in Middleburg. Just a bunch of us gathered up and went on kind of all of a sudden at one time, went down to Middleburg. Oh my, that place can feed you. 
their hamburgers over one pound in that patty after cooking. Say, did you eat it, preacher? Ever bit. <laughs> but you know the way some people are about their Bible, they enjoy being in a church where everybody else or a bunch of people in the church enjoy reading their Bibles. You know what that's like to win? That's like me going in a van with you people to a buffet. Let's all, let's all go down to Golden Corral. How about that? Is there enough to eat at the Golden Corral? Let's all go down to the Golden Corral. But as for me, I'm just going to go and watch everybody eat. There are times when I come close to that here at the church, but, it has, but it's a different reason. It's because of, of what I'm thinking about, about everybody and all. But I want you to know, if you invite me to go to a buffet, I got no plans on watching you enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, after we're over, I may have to ask you what you ate. <laughs> because I'm going to go there primarily when it comes to eating, to eat. And when I go out to eat, I enjoy the fellowship, the friendship, all that kind of stuff. But I will eat. I'm just saying to my friend that... The Word of God is to be your diet. The Word of God is also, according to verse 16, your duty. Every man. And the third thing I want to say about the manna with regard to the fact that it is sustaining is not only is it to be your diet, not only is it to uh, be your duty, but it is also, and I, and I believe it, I, my wife and I, it's a priority for us to read our Bibles, it's duty. Thirdly, and another reason you ought to, to read the Word of God, is the manna was to be desired. One of the greatest insults to God in the Old Testament was when the children of Israel got so used to the manna being there that they got to the point of not being thankful. They got to the point of not appreciating it. They got to the point of not respecting that God gave that to them. The Bible says in one place, Numbers 21, 5, the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Numbers 21, 5. What they're saying is, this is a dull journey. And you know what? That's the problem with a lot of people. They get bored yeah. because it's the same Bible, same message, same uh, ministry, same kind of emphasis that goes over week after week after work, week in Bible-believing churches and people say, my soul loathes is like bread. Yeah. Let me get something different. Let me get something that uh, is more stimulating, something that is more tasty. My beloved... 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, and this is addressed to everybody. It doesn't just say babes. It says, as newborn babes, yeah. desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. The Word of God doesn't say that only babes should desire the milk. The book of Hebrews does talk about when it comes to doctrine that uh, only a babe can only handle the milk. But in 1 Peter 2, 2, it's not talking about the difference between milk and meat. It says, it's talking about the fact that like a baby yeah. wants that milk. Come on, mama, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> as the baby wants that milk, you as a Christian should want the Word of God. Amen. I'm saying you ought to desire it. Amen. I would not want to go to a church where they minimize the Word of God. I would not want to go to church where in the ministry the Word of God wasn't one of the most primary things. That's right. Desire it. I hope that you, you got more to your life than just learning the Bible. I want you to live by the Bible. Mm -hmm. But as do more babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Psalm 19, we learned from a man named Lester Roloff to sing a few verses there. And uh, one of the verses of Psalm 19 says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey 
and the honeycomb. That's Psalm 1910. I'm saying that the Word of God is to be desired. Don't you ever get to the point to where, I, well, it's just that same old stuff. Yeah. Same old stuff. Get saved, get separated, serve God, go soul winning, pray, tithe, read your Bible, and keep on keeping on. Mm -hmm. I know what the preacher's going to preach about. Yeah. Our soul loatheth this light bread. Yeah. I want to close. Probably won't for a while, but I want to. <laughs> I want to close with one more thought about the manna that points to the Bible. And that is, believe it or not, the manna was safeguarded. Even after they got to where they got away from the wilderness journeys, Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Yeah. I realize that typically... Our wilderness journey is not over yet in that sense. God wants us to live by the Word of God as long as we're alive. Yeah. The Word of God should never become just a furniture piece in your home. Yeah. I'm not against, I'm not against anybody having a family Bible place someplace in your home. I'm not against that. But I'm saying that the Word of God is not just so you could put it somewhere and look at it. I think it's that I don't think there's anything wrong with you letting people know. How much the Bible means to you by putting it somewhere. But God didn't give it to you as a piece of furniture. Amen. God gave it to you to live by. Right. God's going to do the keeping. That's right. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Amen. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7 says, Psalm 1989 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God planned to preserve his word. God went to, as far as you and I could look at it from a human standpoint, a lot of trouble to get your Bible to you. That's right, amen number of writers and the number of things that happened to it. Some of y'all are familiar with uh, Jeremiah and, and being commanded to be burned. Some of y'all know something about church history. and You know about the Catholics burning Bibles and some of that. You know some of those things. And so from a human standpoint, God went through a lot to preserve His Word. But you know, He promised That's right. that His Word would always be around. Amen. He promised He would preserve His Word. I'm not worried about global warming. God's promised that He's going to uh, keep this world and this heaven in store until the day of judgment. Yeah. And He's keeping it in store by the Word. Yeah. You read it sometimes. Yeah. By the same Word that created it, the, the heaven and earth which are now are kept in store until the future time when God is going to destroy it all by fire. There will be some global warming someday, but you won't be responsible for it because of your carbon emissions. Yeah. Heaven and earth shall pass away. There's coming a time. And Jesus said, and after that happens, but my words shall not pass away. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. And God has a purpose for keeping His Word. He has a purpose for preserving His Word. I mean, He could have... He could have given it by inspiration, make sure it was written down perfectly, and then not worry about it. And there'd be a lot of mistakes and, and mistranslations and all that. But I believe God has had His hand on this book, and He's kept this book through the years, and it's available in its perfect preserved form right now. Amen. In English. Amen. In a King James 1611 authorized version Bible. Amen. And because of that, we have a sure word to point people to salvation. Amen. Assurance of salvation. We have a sure word to use in soul winning. We have a sure word to be schooled and to grow in our understanding of God and in His precepts. We have a word that can sanctify us and make us clean and holy. Do you know you can't be a sanctified Christian <coughs> without the Word of God? Not like God intends. In that great priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus prayed in John 17, 17 to the Father, about you people. Yeah. And he said, sanctify them. 
through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know how God sets you apart? Makes you clean? Makes you useful? This book. God will sanctify this church as we continue to teach and preach this book. God will sanctify this church as the church listens and conforms to this book. God will sanctify you as an individual if you'll live by this book in your daily life. God will sanctify your marriage. He'll sanctify your home. He'll sanctify your brain, your heart, if you'll cleanse it with a washing of water by the Word. What's the Bible to you? Is it something that you wake up in the morning and you realize that it should be not only a duty but a desire Amen. and a delight to get into it? Or do you just set it aside saying, I'll read it sometime. Yeah. i got things I need to do today. I'll read it sometime, and it sits there. And on Monday, oh my, you came in, you were tired Monday night, and you never picked it up. And the Bible sits in the same place when you go to bed on Monday night that you put it on Sunday night when you got home. Well, a good thing about it is, is you can find it on Wednesday when you come back to church, for those of you who are faithful to church. Yeah. But the bad thing about it is, is you starve yourself spiritually. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. If you didn't get up. It says, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Open thou mine eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let's stand together, please. It's bowed.